Hi everyone, my name is Katherine Honeycutt, the Communications Specialist for BBB serving Eastern North Carolina, and I'm pleased to welcome you to our BBB Business Builders webinar featuring the Senior Manager of Client Solutions at iContact, Hank Hoffmeyer, who is going to share three things that you need to know to keep your email subscribers engaged when they're so distracted during COVID-19. So without further delay, we'll go ahead and dive into today's webinar. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please feel free to drop them in the questions box and we'll be sure to get to them. So Hank, I'll pass it over to you to get us started. Awesome, thank you, Catherine. I'm excited to be here. Glad you joined me today to talk about email marketing. This seems to be our life right now. And if you own a business or you're an entrepreneur, or maybe if you have family throughout the world or throughout the country, you're probably on a lot of Zoom meetings right now. Uh, I know I am, and in the last couple of weeks, I think I've probably had uh, 12 to 15 Zoom meetings just in the last week alone. How about you? In the chat or the question section, go ahead and drop in the amount of Zoom meetings you've had in the last week. It doesn't have to be Zoom. I'm using Zoom as a generic uh, thing, but it could be FaceTime, Zoom, Go to meeting, whatever it is, go and drop in the chat how many meetings you've been on in the last week. I, I want to know because uh, I sort of see where I'm averaging against other folks there. So go ahead, find the chat, find the questions, and just let us know. So, with all these meetings and all these distractions that we have, we're probably not able to stay productive. And maybe as if you're marketing, and that's why you're here today, because you do some of the marketing for your business or you're just a marketer, it's hard to create a lot of content or effective content uh, with the environment that we're currently in right now, uh, especially if you're working from home like me, I have distractions, I have my dogs, my dogs just barked a few minutes ago, probably was UPS man or the Amazon delivery guy. Uh, my kids, you know, they're young, they're, they're gonna make noise, they're gonna scream and yell, and uh, they're, they're gonna watch TV and watch YouTube. Um, then there's always that you know delivery person that's coming that's distracting because they come at different times of the day. There's FedEx, there's UPS, there's Amazon, right? There's all these things going on that keep us distracted and away from our focus point, which should be creating effective marketing tactics. I don't see any answers in the chat yet, so I'm still looking. How many Zoom calls have you had in the last week? Uh, and if for some reason you're having trouble finding out where to put it, hopefully we can uh, uh, figure that out. I'm gonna check question section here i don't see it yet so hopefully you're attentively listening but yeah let us know how many you have in the chat there how many meetings you've had hank i see some on my end we've got a few people saying two or three four we got someone who said six they've had a busy week yes. <laughs> all right i guess i can't see those so uh i'll just ping you every now and then and uh see see what these answer to these questions are so awesome six is the winner um I'm not saying I'm happy or sad for you, but that is a lot. Um, so keep your energy levels up. Make sure you take breaks if you're on a lot of Zoom meetings. That helps. Take a walk and just stay hydrated is something I would say. Uh, right now, it kind of feels like I'm living in that movie Groundhog Day. I don't know if you feel that way, but every day kind of feels very similar and almost the same. And I want to break that cycle. And I'm tired of being in lockdown and I want to get back to normal. But does life seem normal to you right now? there's just a lot going on and there's frustration that this pandemic is causing and we need to develop and execute our marketing campaigns on top of all these distractions that we have going on. The problem is if we're distracted, our email subscribers are also distracted and they may actually be uh, distracted more, right? Because maybe they're unemployed or maybe they got downsized or on furlough or maybe their boss dumped so much more work in their lap because they are actually thriving through a pandemic and they just, they're so busy and they can't cut through the clutter and they have all these things coming at them from social media and in their inbox. It's hard to really get their attention. So more than ever, we have to win the hearts and the minds of our email subscribers so we can unlock our email potential during what I'm calling this new normal. Uh, Catherine and I were talking before we hopped on air here and, and we just said, we don't know when this is gonna be over. When are we gonna get back to normal and will it actually be normal or will it be a new normal? I think it's going to be a new normal, definitely. So let's go ahead, let's dive in and talk about how to overcome distractions in what I call this new normal for email subscribers. First, you have to identify some of the things that people are being distracted by, and it's, it's family, caring for family, caring for their health, 
It's family causing distractions, like I mentioned, children and pets and uh, maybe your mom calling you every 20 minutes to say, did you get the Rona yet or something like that? Or, hey, did you eat? You know, or did you find toilet paper? Because I didn't. Can you bring me some? There's a lot just going on with family members these days, right? And people are worried about their job. They're stressed. They're working. They might be worried about losing their job. Or maybe they are currently unemployed and they're looking for their next position or next job, right? And, and that's a distraction in itself right there. Then we have your health. You know, we want to make sure that we're staying healthy and make sure that we're wearing a mask when we're going out. And every little cough or sneeze you get, you're wondering if you caught the coronavirus and just need to be careful. So that's something that is distracting. I had to go out and buy some stuff from the, the food store the other day. And it is distracting because there's, you know, distance that you got to pay attention to, touching things and just finding, finding parking still because it seems like there is still a lot of cars going to stores. And people are bored, right? Right now they're bored. Maybe they don't want to check their email. They don't want to check social or they're doing it more than ever. Uh, they're combating being bored on the weekend if they work during the week or whenever they're not working, they're trying to figure out what to do because they probably watched everything on Netflix. And uh, I'm finding it hard to, to find good shows. If you have a suggestion for a great show or series, let me know in a chat and Catherine can send that to me later. Or maybe, you know, she can chime in to say, hey, that is an awesome show, Hank. You need to watch that. So drop that in the chat if you have any good ideas on what to watch, because I kind of ran out. People are trying to adapt to this new normal, and that's time consuming. That distracts people. You got to make sure that you keep that in mind when you're creating your email campaigns. And then there's just the shiny object syndrome, you know, ooh, ah, this over here. Hey, I want to go build something. For me, I'm, I'm, I'm a tech guy. I love computers. I love creating videos. I love doing webinars. I'm not really much of a crafter, but uh, I said, hey, I want a standing desk because I'm working from home and I want to stand more and, uh, and stay healthy and not you know, have my legs always in a seated position. I watched a YouTube video of a guy who made a tabletop for a desk and actually created one myself out of wood. I just bought some lumber, sanded it down, screwed them together, stained it, and put it on uh, these legs that go up and down. It's a standing desk. And that distracted me for a while because I was out sanding every night and then I was staining the wood. And it's something I normally don't do. Therefore, it could be considered a new hobby or a distraction, however you look at it. Email marketing is still king right now. It's one of the channels that are the most lucrative, right? For, uh, for marketers, they need to pay attention to using email and not moving over to social uh, for everything they do because with email, you can still do things that are personal, make it feel like a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Here, drop in the chat, let me know, when you first wake up in the morning, do you check your email? Is that one of the first things you do? Just, just a simple why or yes is uh, good there. So, so I wanna know, when you wake up in the morning, is one of the first things you do, check your email, or do you check it within the first few minutes of waking up? And Catherine, just chime in if you're getting some, some answers there, because I have a feeling most people are gonna say yes. Uh, for me, that's true. It's mm -hmm. the first thing I reach for. It's on my nightstand on my wireless charger, grab it, start checking my email, say, hey, is there anything important I need to attend to right now? And then I look at my calendar and then maybe I'll head over to social media. Uh, so any answers there, Catherine? Yeah, we got a few yeses. We got some no's. Um, we've got someone saying, I refuse to exercise before emails. So that's awesome. They get their workout in and then they can check their emails. I love that. I, I like it. And probably it sounds like there it's almost maybe like 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 40, 40, 20 or something like that, mm -hmm. or or 50, 50. Uh, I applaud you if you do not check your email right away when you wake up because it is addicting. It becomes a habit. And I wanted to ask that because 80% of people check their email within 80%, uh, 15 minutes of waking up. And why that's important is if you're an email marketer and you're sending emails, keep in mind 80% of people are checking their emails. And if you said, no, you don't, just think your subscribers probably are, and that's powerful. Email marketing is 40% more effective than other channels. It's more effective than pay-per-click. It's more effective than social media advertising. That's why you need to be using it. 61% of American workers say email is very important to the job they do, and they're always in their inbox. And if you're a B2B marketer and you're on this webinar today, keep in mind 83% of B2B marketers say email marketing is one of the most powerful channels that they use when it comes to marketing their business. Everyone uses email, or pretty much everyone does, because 95% of online consumers use email. Why not be in 
the the medium that they're in and give them messages where they want to read them, and that's in their inbox. 72% of consumers say that email marketing is the preferred channel, preferred channel to receive from brands that they want to do business with or have a relationship with. Still powerful. We, we have not become bored of email and it has not gone the way of MySpace, which is an old deprecated social media platform for younger folks on the webinar today. Even with distractions, email works. But you can't just go and create an email and send it. You can't say, oh my God, it's Friday at three o'clock. I need to get an email out because I didn't send anything out all week. Slap something together, put a mediocre subject line on it and just send it out the door. Have you ever done that in the chat? Drop a yes or no. Yes, I've waited till the last minute, the end of the week, to create an email and send it out. And maybe it did good, maybe it didn't do good, but it's probably not the best practice that you should do. Mm -hmm. We've got a little bit of both on that one. Yes and no. I'm sure we all have at some point or another. <laughs> right. It's, it's like standing at the craps tables in Vegas, right? Because you don't know if you're going to win or you're going to lose. You, you could do well. Maybe you have a stroke of genius when it comes to your content and your subject line. Uh, or maybe you just put it together and it was sloppy and it didn't do well. But you were proud of yourself because you got something out the door. But what we're going to do today is talk about what you need to be doing to make sure that all your emails are effective. The first item is subject lines. It's the first thing people see when they get your email is the subject line. That's why it's important. But if you're just winging it and you're waiting till the last minute to send your emails, you know, it's going to kind of look like this in the inbox. They're not, people are not going to pay attention to your subject line. They're not going to read your email. And, you know, this may be what they see or quote unquote do not see, right? Remember, we're all distracted right now. We're glancing through our inbox and something needs to catch our attention. So let's put our reading glasses on and dive into what you need to be doing with your subject lines. Since it is the first thing that they see, you wanna make sure you're personalizing the subject line. When you gather subscriber data, you should always ask for an email address and a first name. This way you can personalize the subject line. Hello, Hank, comma, we have a great sale today. I don't know what it is, but when somebody uses my name, it makes me feel good. Even though I know it's probably injected by an algorithm or a computer or software, it still makes me feel good. It's like being out and about and somebody yells your name when you're in a crowded area. You kind of perk up, turn around and look to see who called your name. Same thing with reading your name in the inbox. It gets your attention and causes you to hopefully read that subject line. You can use emoji in the subject lines and it helps you stand out from the crowd, from other marketers. But a little bit of suggestion here is make sure that these emojis are really relevant to the subject line. In other words, don't mislead people and just use the ones like fire, like just because it's a hot sale. Maybe that one's kind of close, but like you don't want to have fire and then say something like all cookies are on sale, right? That's That doesn't mean it's the hottest item that you have. It doesn't mean that it's a hot sale. Just be careful and also test it just to make sure it shows up correctly in all email platforms. Your subject line should be about six to 10 words in length. That's optimal. That means it probably will not get cut off in the inbox and it'll make sense to whoever's reading it. Then there's something called the pre-header. Now this is something that's very powerful. The pre-header to me is like what Robin is to Batman. They make a dynamic duo. You have your subject line and that gets the attention because it's bold and it has should have some, some of the great content for what's coming inside the email then your pre-header is an extension of your subject line. subject line. You've probably seen this in Gmail and Outlook. See the subject line in bold, and then there's words next to that. Pretty much that is just the first little bit of text that is in the email, or there's designated areas for pre-headers in some email platforms, and it's just the first bit of text. And you might see, cannot view this email, click here to view online. To me, that's wasted real estate, where you should be saying something like, hello, Hank, comma, we have a great sale today. Free shipping on all orders over $49.99 would be the pre-header. And that gave me a little bit more room as a marketer to tell people I had free shipping. And it was acted as an extension of my subject line. Very powerful. Make sure you're using them effectively. And make sure you're testing everything. And especially with subject lines, what you want to do is do something called split A-B testing. Take one version of your email, copy it. So you have version A and version B, nothing changed. Change the subject line in version B. So you have one subject line for version A, one subject line for version B. You're gonna send version A out to about 10% of your subscribers. 
and then version B out to another 10% of your subscribers. And most, most platforms have this functionality built in. Then you're gonna wait about a day or two and what you're gonna do is go back and look and whichever one had the higher open rate, you're gonna send out that winner to the remaining 80% of your subscribers. It's like getting free opens in every email because you're sending the most effective email. And it allows you to test the preheader, allows you to test the subject line. Just don't test too many elements at once. You can also use testing for content if you want. But again, don't do subject line and content at the same time because maybe you won't know what actually caused people to either convert or open. Now, we're going to get a little personal here because I, I want to make sure that I'm driving the point home about using data correctly. And by being personal is make sure you're using that first name in the subject line and also in the content. You're collecting other data, uh, whether it's when you have somebody fill out a form or maybe later you're doing a survey, you find out when somebody's birthday is or maybe it's an anniversary of when they've done business with you or um, uh, it's a renewal date. Use that data. Hey, Hank, we see your birthday is next week. Here's a coupon for 20% off. So you can use that information in an email to get people to convert or even open if it's in the subject line. If you're gathering location information, not only can you segment on that by creating filters and sending to people that are in certain areas, you can inject that into um, the email as well. Hank, we have some great uh, events going on in Raleigh this weekend. Hey, Hank, we have some great events going on in Durham this week. Just depends on where you live, and you can inject that as long as you're collecting that data. Then if you are selling a product or a service and you collect that data, you can put that into the email as well. Thank you for purchasing a new hat from us. And that would be automatically injected. Thank you for using my consulting service, my financial consulting service. You can inject all that information into subject lines as well as the body of the email. What you wanna do is make sure on your subject lines, you're using action words. You want people to take action. You want them to feel like if they don't do something, they're gonna miss out. Uh, the first one would be act now. And then you have save, you know, exclamation point, limited time offer. That leads me to believe that I have to act right away. Last chance, if I don't act now, I won't be able to in the future. Help yourself, uh, new video, learn how, find out why. That creates curiosity and it creates an action and people should open your email based on those action words. Here's an example of subject lines and pre-headers. So this is what you see in, this, in uh, your inbox. You see who it's from, you see the subject line, and then you see the unbold text, which is the pre-header, and then the time it was sent. I see some really good use of action words in here, um, and I see pre-headers, but I see that there's something missing. Can somebody in a chat point out what's missing in this example here? And it's, this is my inbox. This is a screenshot from my inbox, and there's one thing missing that we've already reviewed. I bet you did not know there was going to be a quiz today. Catherine, let me know if you have any guesses. I'm going to give it a moment or two. Yeah, will do. Um, we've got someone already chimed in, and they said personalization. First exactly. Name. Glad, glad if somebody, and hopefully everybody is paying attention. Yeah, a couple That's people exactly. are chiming in with that same answer. Awesome. Yep, that's exactly what it is. Nobody's using my first name. Uh, and I did that on purpose because I want to see if everybody was paying attention. Uh, but I do get a, a good amount of brands that do actually use my first name. A lot of times I see it in the pre-header uh, rather than the subject line. Uh, actually, there is one. Uh, it says, hey, Hank, uh, just sheets email there. Uh, it's in the pre-header, but not in the subject line. So I guess I lied when saying it's not there at all. Uh, but good catch, everyone. They should be using more personalization to make me feel good and boost my ego. Let's move on to number two, which is be relevant. Now that you got the interest of your subscribers with your email subject line, you need to get them to engage. They have to actually open. To do that, you need to be relevant. A marketer's job is to get qualified leads that convert to a sale. That's, or if you're doing everything in your company, you have all hats, you know, your job is to get people to find out who you are and do business with you. Most marketers use the spray and pray mentality, you know, kind of like what I said earlier, of just slapping an email together and putting it out, or they're just gonna say, I'm gonna take this email and just send it out to everyone and just hopefully somebody's gonna buy from me because I'm gonna have a great deal. I'm gonna offer 30% off today. The thing is, you know, the marketers do not really have a strategy oftentimes because they feel like they're just gonna put an email together, put in their newest and latest and greatest products or the products that are on sale, and they're gonna send that email. Um, and I already asked the question of, have you ever sent a last minute email? Some people said yes, and some people said no. Um, and like I said, it may ha have done well, and it may not have done well. 
but the more you actually plan and strategize, the better your emails are gonna do. We've all had a conversation with someone where we were not really interested in what they were saying, but we acted like we were paying attention. Admit it, you, probably, you don't have to drop that in the chat, but you've probably done that. And I know I have, there's times where I've sat there and I'm, mm -hmm, yep, mm -hmm, and I'm listening. And it's easy to make people feel like they should keep talking when you actually don't care about the conversation. With email marketing, it's easy to do the same thing. You keep sending emails that people don't wanna read and they're just gonna act like, you know, they're interested, but they're not because they're not going to unsubscribe. And, you know, but there are going to be some people that will market as spam or they're going to unsubscribe and, and then maybe they simply may delete your email or just keep it in the inbox and ignore it. Right. And you don't want that to happen because these are all negative things that happen to your email. And you might say, oh, yeah, well, I have a list of 10,000 email addresses. That's pretty cool. You know, and I send to them and somebody's going to buy to me at some point. But if they're not opening and engaging with your emails, is it actually worth sending it to them? There's a whole nother discussion around email deliverability, all these negative things I just mentioned, unsubscribe, spam, and ignoring your emails actually hurts your email deliverability. In other words, every time bad things happen, it hurts your domain reputation. In other words, your domain has kind of like a credit score. And then as it gets lower because of the bad things, your email is gonna go into a spam folder and say Gmail and Yahoo and other domains. But if you're doing good things and people are reading your emails because of your subject lines and are opening them and clicking them, forwarding them, marking it as important, et cetera, you have a better chance getting your inbox, email into the inbox and getting it engaged with. So keep in mind that you want to be relevant in the inbox. The best thing to do to be relevant is provide value to your audience, right? No matter what you want to say as a marketer or as a salesperson, you need to make sure, does this make sense to my audience? Is it providing value to them, whether it's just information for this email, or even if it's an offer, is it a valuable offer? Think about the bank analogy that I'm gonna use right here. What you wanna do is start offering deposits or providing deposits, and this is gonna be valuable information. Maybe it's why your products and services are the best, why you're better than your competitors, and free white paper information, blog articles, uh, or, or it could be certain coupons and certain discounts that are better than others. If you're always offering a 10% off coupon, it's not really relevant all the time because people can open any email and get 10% off. But what you're doing is you're giving people all this value over time and you're giving them this information, you're giving them savings and you're building a, uh, a relationship with them that matters, right? Because then what you could do is you can make a withdrawal. You can go ahead and run your promotions and ask for the sale this way that you have that relationship now, people trust you, you're a little bit more relevant, hopefully people will convert. But one thing is just make sure that you make more deposits than you do withdrawals because you don't want to overdraft your bank account and cause people to unsubscribe, mark your messages spam, delete it and ignore it. Make sure that you're using the bank analogy of making a lot of deposits and withdrawals. And if you're a fan of Gary Vaynerchuk, uh, he is a well-known marketer and advertising uh, agency owner. He has this book, Jab, Jab, Right Hook. I highly recommend reading it. It, it hits pretty much just like the bank analogy. When you wanna jab, 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 right hook, value, 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 then you're gonna ask for the sale. It works. I know it creates a lot of work on your behalf to create more content, but in the end, it's worth it. And what can help with that is going to be automation because if you're using marketing automation you're going to have a lot more relevancy and we're going to talk about what that means what you'll do is you'll improve your efficiency create a personalized experience for your subscribers and give them emails in a timely manner when they are more likely to engage with your email you're able to market to your audience no matter what stage the buying cycle that they're in and that's so helpful um, you want to send the right message to the right person at the right time so that they're more likely to open and convert. For me, marketing automation pretty much is convincing the right people to need what you have at the right time. Think about that. That's powerful. When you, If you don't need something and you're trying to sell to me, I'm probably not going to buy. But if you find me when I want to buy something and it's relevant information, I'm probably going to end up converting. When we talk about today's ever-changing and diverse uh, world we live in now and then also with you know you throw this pandemic on top everybody is so distracted right but one thing is they're empowered they have information at their fingertips tips they're going to be able to look up pricing reviews 
whatever they want. Oh, I want to buy this product or service. Let me go do some uh, research, some in information gathering and find out reviews and pricing so that I go into this decision armed with data that I can use to either get a better deal or make sure I'm making the right purchase. You know, they're hands-on, they know where to go. They're going to go to Yelp, they're going to go to Facebook, they're going to go to LinkedIn and they're going to ask for recommendations. They're going to check Amazon reviews. They're going to look everywhere and look at Google and look at your About Us page and, and they just know where to get this information. They're smart. They, they know what to look for these days where years ago, sometimes you didn't know what product or service to even start looking for and where to find certain reviews. Now there's YouTube, people can watch reviews online. They're vocal, right? If they have a bad experience with you, they're definitely gonna shout that out on social media and leave a bad review on Amazon, Yelp, or even Google. And, then, and if they have a good experience with you, there might be a good chance that they'll leave you a good review. They're definitely going to, uh, today's Empowered Consumer is definitely going to talk about their experiences, good or bad, especially on social media these days. And today's Empowered Consumer is committed. You know, if you give them value and you're relevant, they're going to turn around and they're going to give you their money. They're going to give you their trust and they're going to do business with you. No matter where in the world this empowered consumer is, they can do research and they can make purchases. And they're concerned. Am I going to keep my job right now? Am I going to be working next year, next month, tomorrow? What does, you know, this look like with this COVID-19 going around? Am I going to get sick? Is my family members going to get sick? Am I going to have medical bills? You know, what's going to happen? Do I need to move now because I can't afford where I am? Or maybe I want to work from home now, so I'm going to move into the suburbs out of the city. They're concerned about a lot of different things. Therefore, if you're more relevant in the inbox, it's going to help you out more. If you want to be relevant, you need to be relevant right away. The first thing you need to do is when you collect email addresses, what you want to do is send a welcome email and say, thank you for signing up for my email newsletter. If I give you my email address and first name, and then you wait two weeks to email me, it's too late. You can't really develop the same type of relationship. And I may not actually even remember who you are. What you're going to do is you're going to set those expectations. Thank you, Hank, for signing up for our newsletter. This is what you can expect. An email from us at least once a week with our new products and services, a couple of reviews here and there, and how to do some things, uh, some marketing, how to do some marketing things on your own. Maybe it's a, a marketing organization, you're trying to help me and give me some information that will be that value they're trying to offer because they're not trying to sell to me yet. It helps reduce those complaints, sorry, and they'll remember, uh, I'll, I'll remember who they are if they send it to me, and I won't mark the messages spam or unsubscribe, it helps. And you're basically just starting to mess the, the relationship off right and it's going to develop over time and get that email right away makes you feel good. Oh, I, I entered my information here. They got it. They sent me a welcome email. Now I feel like I can start receiving emails from this brand. Here's a thank you offer from Caribou Coffee. You know, they're giving you a free drink on your birthday and they're giving you a discount. And, uh, you know, it's basically they're not asking you to spend a lot of money or they're not really overtly selling to you, but they want to give you value and they're going to give you some freebies here. Um, and if you want to do business with them, you do have those offers. And that's one welcome message. Uh, Michael's is offering a 20% off coupon for signing up and uh, um, they're just thanking you for signing up there. And it's signed by the, the president of the company. And then if you're in B2B, you have a litmus here. They're just saying, woohoo, you're in. And uh, they're going to tell you that they're going to inform you about tips, case studies, and resources when it comes to uh, checking how your emails are going to look on every type of device there is. And that's what litmus does. You send an email to litmus and they show you how it looks in different email platforms. What you want to do is make sure you use a series or sequence of emails to help you remain relevant and top of mind right away and then down the road. Develop content that builds on something in a series of emails and get people wanting to have the next email come into their inbox so that they can open it. You wanna create a sense of FOMO or mystery. Give your some subscribers something to look forward to and you can even allude to that in the email and say something like in our next email, we're gonna talk about or we're gonna offer or we're gonna do this, or this is a series one of three. In this one, we'll talk about this, the other two, will include this and this, and it gets people intrigued and they'll want to continue opening your emails. Research has shown that you need to touch prospects at least eight times before they actually buy from you. In some situations, marketers have given up after one or two attempts. Um, you know, especially when it comes to service-based companies, they tend to give up right away. They get a lead and right away they just give up. They, they send them one or two emails or call them once or twice and that's it. But 
at the very least, you want to have that welcome email that we just discussed. Have a welcome email no matter what. That's something you have to do. And now what you want to do is have that nurture series. And that can be information about your company, what you're doing in the community, information about your return policies, your support support information, help desk information if you have that, reviews, testimonials, how to follow you on social email, social media. Those are just a couple ways that you can use uh, an automated series to figure out how to start a relationship with someone. You can also trigger emails in a series to go out at the right time based on data and information. And let's talk about those triggers. They can be activity-based. Did somebody open an email? So if they did, I wanna follow up with this other email. Did they not open an email? I'm gonna wait three or four days and resend that same email with a different subject line. That can save you time and it helps you get that second chance in the inbox to be more relevant and to build that relationship. It can be date-based. It can be based on a anniversary date, the birth date, an upcoming date of say a webinar or a workshop. You can trigger or have people go through a series based on that information. And then you have data. So where is somebody located? What purchases have they made? What's their first name? What's their favorite color? You can use all this information to trigger a workflow or a nurture series of emails to help people convert more. Here's an example of a welcome series. And we have our welcome email. And I'm gonna send that right away as soon as somebody gets added to a list. And three days later, I'm gonna send them an email. It's a differentiator email, tells uh, folks how I'm different than, or how this company is different from their competitors. And then it's gonna you know, wait a few days, two days after that, and uh, resend a message to people that did not open. If not, it's an emotional appeal email. And that's kind of like jab, jab, right hook. Uh, and then there, um, we're looking at people who did not open the differentiator email and then uh, sending them the emotional appeal email. So it's based on when somebody enters a list, then you're gonna give them that welcome email and then send a series of emails. And this is just a short one as an example. This one's based on a specific date. So this one say is for a webinar that's coming up. So 10 days before, I'm gonna send out an email about the webinar, get people to, to sign up maybe, or get interested in it. Uh, three days before, or five days before, I'm gonna remind people and um, folks that registered, I can give them one email. Folks that didn't register, I can give them another email. Uh, three days before, I can remind everybody that the webinar is coming up, and I can even have a step in there again to check if somebody's registered or not, if you have that data. And then one day after, anyone who actually attended that webinar, I can send a thank you, or I can add them to a different list that uh, gives a series of information. Thank you for attending our webinar. Here's some more information. Uh, hopefully this is helpful. So that's the use of a specific date in an automation series. And then we have something called segment qualification. So this one's going to be anyone who has the last open date in the last six months. So this would be kind of like list hygiene or doing a, what we call a win back campaign. We're identifying people who've been in the account for six months that haven't opened in six months. We're gonna send them a message. And right away, we're gonna send, as soon as I meet that criteria, uh, send them an email, are we breaking up? Question mark. I don't know about you, but if somebody's breaking up with me, I wanna open that email and find out why. Uh, and then five days later, I'm going to check and see whoever did not open that first email. I'm going to say, are you being a ghost? Are you ghosting us? And in these emails, you're asking them to say subscribe. That, hey, do you want to still receive our emails? And if they don't, they can unsubscribe or just ignore the email. And then we're going to send a third email uh, roughly 10 days after we first sent that first email to anyone who did not open the first two emails. And we're going to say, here are the divorce papers. And anyone who has not opened any of those emails, what you want to do is actually get rid of them, take them off the list so you don't email them. And what this does is it helps your email deliverability and keeps people that are engaged on your list, helps you get into the inbox more so people can see your subject line, to see that you're relevant so that you can jab, jab, right hook, and then convert to a sale. Here's another custom date, and this would be a subscription expiration type of an example. 30 days before somebody's subscription expires, we're gonna send an email. Again, seven days, one day after it expires, we can remind them, hey, your subscription is now expired. Seven days after, 14 days after, and even 30 days after to try to win their hearts and minds and get them to come back and subscribe again. Those were just a few examples of using automation and using a nurture series whether it's based on a date or data or an action. 
They're very powerful. I highly recommend using email automation. Drop in the chat if you are currently using automation or uh, a no if you want to get started. And uh, Catherine, whenever you get a few of those, just, just shout those out for me. All right, will do. The last item is going to be, you need to be entertaining, right? Uh, what is the best way to combat distractions? Just to be entertaining and interesting. In comedy, you know, one bad joke can alienate the crowd and cause people to stop paying attention. Uh, comedians need to be on point. They need to practice a lot, right? They need to develop their content before they get on stage. You'd be amazed with how many people um, or how much preparation comedians actually do before they go on stage and how much testing they do with their material. You know, if you think that you're gonna just wing it with your next email marketing campaign, the joke's on you, right? And, and cause if you're not doing what comedians do with the preparation and strategy, it's just not gonna do well. Any answers on that, Catherine? We got a few saying automation. Okay, so hopefully that means they're using it. And if not, I encourage you to use it. So just hit me up uh, outside of the webinar if you need some help with that. So your templates or whatever types of emails you sent out, they need to entertain. You have less than three seconds to grab your subscribers' attention as soon as they open that email. If it's cluttered, it's going to be distracting and they're gonna say, you know what, I'm out of here. I'm not gonna read it. And you don't wanna be a clone. You don't wanna use the same template over and over. Recopy the old email you sent, change some content and send it again because it just gets boring and repetitive and people will fatigue out. They'll stop reading your emails. What you wanna do is make sure you're testing your content, um, subject lines and your content. So not just your subject lines. Just because you think your content is awesome, it doesn't mean your audience is going to agree with you all the time. And the first way to entertain your subscribers is to have multiple templates that you can use to help engage people more and make your emails feel a little less repetitive. How many of you have more than one template variety? Go ahead, drop that in the chat. Let's take a look at some examples of elements that you can put in to create different versions of your email. Here's one based on a product. Uh, this company, I80 Equipment, sells trucks. They sell utility trucks. And what they do is they use a classic Z pattern here, which is left, right, and down. That's what we do when we read. Our eyes go from left to right and down. And what I8 Equipment will do in this, in this template that has placeholder uh, content is they would put pictures of their products or their trucks and information about each one. This way you would look at more than one items that they have for sale or one, one truck. They also put a, a video in the lower left-hand corner that you see there that hopefully gets people to engage with that. And then Stanley Korshak has a good template item here. They have a, what's called a huge hero image or a large image. Maybe this is a new line of clothing they want to promote. They would put that in there and then have your call to action where it says promo text goes here and that's the header. And um, then what you want to do, or heading, and then what you want to do is put verbiage about whatever you're trying to sell, that product or service. Here's a simple email from Macon, Georgia. Uh, it's from their visitor center. When uh, you sign up for their newsletter, they send you this, this simple email. It just gets you to go back to their website to learn more and not have a lot of information that keeps going on and on and, and is boring. They want you to basically just say, hey, you signed up now. Here's some great ways to start a relationship with us. Go to our website, follow us on social media and get started. Back to rock. I, I love this template because it's, it's very bold with colors and that's what they do where the, you see the purple, orange and blue. They're using a variety of colors to keep your mind engaged with the email so that you stay more in tune with it and it's not boring by having just that blue header type color going throughout the whole email. It would look very boring. My eyes, when I first saw this, tended to go and flow throughout the whole template. The Bates group, what they're doing here is something interesting. Uh, they're using different fonts to keep your brain uh, engaged and it tends to make you be drawn down, especially since it's centered. Um, you wanna be careful if a majority of your subscribers are mobile-based, you probably wanna stay away from the centered type of text here like we have here because that can kind of uh, be frustrating to read because our brains were not meant to read like this all the time uh, especially like when you read a book and if you if it was like this it would be horrible uh, but you know when it's full page like on a computer it looks great if it's left justified and a lot of email platforms actually do mobile responsive templates it'll look different on a mobile device and different on a desktop 
Then we have Astro. I love how they incorporate customer testimonials and then they link to their blog posts. Uh, that's a way to create engagement and keep it less boring and repetitive is having a little bit of different content in there to keep the subscribers attention. When it comes to developing your templates, just make sure it's not cluttered. Make sure you don't have a lot of uh, just busyness going on inside your template. Here's a simple one from Apple. They get away with having a lot of what we call white space and allows you to read what's there and see the image that's in front of you, that hero image. If I was to clutter this up and put 12 products on there and some text, it probably just would look horrible. And then we have negative space, which is more black. Uh, they're using black and white images and then they're had, they have a lot of spacing around uh, the template here, and it just really makes you want to look at that first image, read the header there. Then if that is kind of engaging, you'll still go on and read the other three because maybe that first uh, link there is not important to you or, or not relevant and you don't want to read that, but maybe the other ones are. Um, it's a great way to get attention is to drive the eyeballs where they need to be. And even when it comes to win back emails or those emails I talked about to make sure people want to stay on your list, you know, have fun with it. Um, Create fun emails when it comes to that. Don't just say, hey, we noticed you haven't opened our emails. Do you want to stay on our list? If you don't, we'll probably remove you. It's kind of boring. Um, I love the use of uh, stuffed pets and rail pets here, different types of fonts. Chipotle is having fun with their font there and uh, coloring in their buttons and then in, out. And then we hate goodbyes, uh, the one on the right. I, I like how well that one's done. And they're putting a picture of human beings there because it is a relationship with email and they want to make sure that you want to stay in the know. If your business allows, adding compelling short stories to your emails can be very effective. You, know, you want to make them relevant to your audience and to your business so that people can relate to them. If they can relate to the story you tell and it relates to your business and to them in life, it goes such a long way. As a speaker myself, I get up on stages and I do webinars and workshops uh, like I'm doing today with this webinar. We can tell stories and it just it makes the presentation so much better, so much more enjoyable. Try that in emails because if they're executed well, it's going to help you build a relationship and people will want to do business with you. Stories are powerful. Here's some tips, but it doesn't mean that you need to use each and every one of these. Uh, some of these might work for you and some of them maybe not. One thing is you should not be the focus of the story. Choose another hero, choose somebody else. Uh, maybe it's a customer, uh, maybe it's a product or a service that you wanna talk about that uh, should be in the story. But if you talk about yourself, people will think that you're a little ego inflated and maybe it won't come across as good as it should. And you can have a hero and a villain in your story. That makes it powerful, right? Maybe your product or service is the hero and there's some kind of a villain. You know, How did your product or service help somebody overcome a challenge in their life? that would go a long way and help you sell more products and services. Stories should be memorable and transferable. Somebody should be able to regurgitate or uh, say what that story is to someone else and make it more powerful so it is memorable. Solve a problem in your story. I just mentioned that a minute ago. Uh, find a way to solve a problem so that people feel like if they buy your product and service, their, pro their, their problems will be solved as well. Your story should have a goal. Don't just tell a story. Tell a story that has a goal and it solves a problem. Create aha moments in your stories. I didn't think of that. Oh, wow, that's awesome. Hmm, maybe this product or service will do that for me. Solve a need. Your customers have needs. Go ahead and solve them and use stories to help you do that and create the want. You want people to work with you. You want people to buy from you. Jab, jab, right, hook. Get them to want, then hit them with the clothes. Humans are visual by nature. We love images and video. They help convey our campaign message quickly and they'll attract more attention. The recipient's eyes are drawn towards images and more videos. You probably watched this little short video when I put this up and, and it's engaging and it just creates movement on the screen. And, People tend to watch it, right? Text message or text information is often ignored or passed by, but images and video really go a long way. According to entrepreneur.com, 95% of video content is retained versus 10% with text. In other words, if you just put text in your emails, the retention rate's not so high. 
But if you use a video or at least images, people are gonna retain a lot more information from watching that video or even just seeing an image, maybe an image with text on it. You can have an increase of your click-through rate by 300% by including a video. People want to click on videos, they want to watch videos. You can reduce your unsubscribe rates by 75% just by including videos that engage people. And by using the term video in your subject line, you can have seven to 13% higher open rates with your email campaigns. Those are powerful reasons why you wanna use video in your emails and at least appealing and, uh, and really interesting images to keep people's attention and to get them thinking about some things in their mind when it comes to building a relationship with you and then converting. Here's a couple of examples of videos and email. Here's five by. Um, it, it's a pretty good example about uh, learning magic. And uh, this is an email where I looked at it and said, mm, I like magic and I'll click through. And I actually did when I received this email, I clicked through so I can learn the magic trick. And we have Twitter and what they're doing is they're appealing to the adventurous side in all of us. Um, they added in dogs and cats and they kind of make it irresistible that you really want to go ahead and click through those, those videos there and watch them. Now we have Litmus, again, a B2B example. They're offering an email testing service, like I mentioned, and this is geared to people that are more logical and, and more technical in a way, or maybe a marketer. And that's why they can get away with having a little bit of tech talk in their, their email template. And then you might wanna say, hmm, well, uh, how does it actually work? Maybe I'll watch this video and I'll find out more about how Litmus works and, and I'll try them out. People want something to relate to. They want to be focused. Your job is to be visible in the inbox, send relevant content that is entertaining and engaging, and you want to provide value. Remember the bank analogy and jab, jab, right hook. Get that book if you want to and read that. And really what I want you to do is get people to be less distracted and become more of a raving fan of your brand because what you're gonna do is you're gonna be visible, you're gonna send relevant, uh, awesome looking templates and have great content in there, you're gonna tell stories, you're gonna provide value, and most importantly, you're gonna use marketing automation either more or you're gonna start using that. So send more email, but send more relevant emails. And with that, what I wanna do is I wanna provide you with some free resources and have a way to stay in touch with me. If you text Hank to 33777, what I wanna do is and I add you to my journal, which I send out once a month. And I include uh, kind of like a story or something that I've learned that month that's related to making me do better at work or be a better father, husband, kind of like a, a lesson learned. This way you can learn from my mistakes. And then I incorporate cool apps that I found, books that I've read, podcasts and uh, apps that, that, that I just can't live without and maybe a little how-to, maybe how to take a wide video and put it on your Instagram story, I've done that. And then I also include some upcoming events that I might be doing, such as this webinar. It's a great way to stay in touch with me. I'm not really selling anything. I might talk about eye contact every now and then, something they're offering. And also when you sign up by texting Hank to 33777, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you eye contact's ultimate subject line guide, 501 examples of good and bad subject lines that you should use. They're broken down by industry, by message type. It's very helpful. It's actual eye contact data. We provide you with the actual open rates for each of the subject lines. I think it's an awesome resource. Then also eye contact's content calendar. If you don't want to sign up for any of this, my journal or the subject line guide, you just want the content calendar. On the first of every month, I've been sending links uh, on my social media channels to each page, but you just got to wait for the first of the month for each page. Or if you text Hank to 33777, I'm gonna give you the content guide for the remainder of the year. It's a great way to plan your content, look for holidays that you can send emails uh, in relation to, and then there's a planning little section for your email so you can plan effectively. Uh, with that, I wanna move into Q&A, but I appreciate your time today. Uh, it's awesome to be here and to just talk about email marketing. So I'd love to stay on for a little while and answer some questions. Awesome, thank you so much, Hank. And just a reminder to all of our attendees, if you have questions, please be sure to put them in the questions box and we'll get to them. We do have a few in already. So the first one I'll go ahead and um, read out to you. It says, being in the laboratory or scientific market, how do you make your mailer stand out since COVID-19 is a very saturated topic in that division? 
almost like with when this first started happening, all the airlines started jumping on the same bandwagon. And I noticed it's almost like they use the same template. It's almost like they use the same cookie cutter content. What you want to do is just stand out from the crowd as best as you can. Uh, use the emojis and use emotion and, and show that you care. And the folks that already have a relationship, they're going to open and engage with your emails. Just the folks that don't often, you just need to catch their eye and then back it up with that valuable information. Uh, it, it's tough to really tell you exactly what to do. I know you kind of told me that, you know, that industry, but if you want to talk specifically, definitely reach out to me and we can come up with some ideas. But just you need to stand out from everyone else and do something a little bit different. But don't trick your subscribers into opening or clicking. Uh, it does need to be relevant on, and just try different things. Test what works is probably the best advice I can give you. But I would say e uh, emojis to stand out in the inbox, personalization, and then those action words go a long way as well. Awesome. Thanks for that advice. Uh, another question we have says, um, what tips do you have for more visually appealing emails? Any free stories you could recommend? You definitely want to use great images. You want to use you know, coloring. Uh, they say that, you know, colors like green, orange, blue tend to do well with buttons. You know, black sometimes it just depends if it fits in your template. Uh, make sure your your images are quality. Just you know, there's nothing worse than having really grainy or uh, non-relatable images. Yes and no to stock photography that you can get from like Unsplash.com or Pixabay. You just gotta be careful. Is it relevant to your business or is it you know some image that doesn't have anything to do with your product or service, but you used it because it's like a city image, right? Um, just because it, it looked cool to you doesn't mean it's going to resonate with your audience. A lot of it comes down to, to design. Just make sure that it looks good. Preview it. Show it to a couple people. Use Litmus to make sure it looks good in different platforms. Email on Acid is another provider that does the same thing. It, it checks your email, make sure it's going to look good. Uh, but both of these questions, it's kind of, it can be tailored to individuals differently. And it's kind of a general question. If you want to talk specifically, I am definitely open to it. Um, you know, once you text, uh, to get on my newsletter, you're definitely gonna have my email address, but I'm all over the socials there. If you just search for Hank Hoffmeyer, I definitely show up, so connect with me. Uh, one thing I ask if you're gonna connect with me on LinkedIn is that you just mention you're on this webinar and why you wanna connect. I have this this rule about connecting with people that send me blind invites, I don't accept them because uh, I've gotten bitten too many times by salespeople, and I really wanna have a strong, powerful, connected network. So just let me know that you're on the webinar and why you wanna connect. Awesome. Another question we got, it was really more a feedback of someone who um, they don't necessarily use email marketing to connect with potential consumers or customers, but rather other businesses. So just wanted to see if you have any tips for kind of B2B email marketing or any, um, you know, just advice that you could give there. Right. One thing I'll mention, I did a webinar for the content marketing conference. Uh, I think they might still have the presentations up and free for everyone this year. I was supposed to speak in Boston, uh, but that got canceled because of COVID and we ended up doing it digitally. Uh, there's a whole presentation on B2B email marketing. Go over there, check that out, register. You could probably still get it for free. Uh, I also wrote a blog post over there on their, their blog. Uh, check that out. Um, but B2B is not that much different. Uh, there's some challenges with email deliverability because you're sending to mostly business domains. So the in, getting into the inbox is challenging and fighting those email filters. So looking at keywords that you're using, your text to image ratio is important. In other words, you need to have more text than images or video in there. Otherwise it may get flagged as spam. Uh, you really just only want to be sending, I say this for B2B all the time, you only want to send emails to people that want your emails. Do not buy a purchase list and use that. There's so many more negatives to that than positive. Those are just a few. Again, I'd be happy to have a conversation with you and definitely check out that presentation at the Content Marketing Conference website. Uh, like I said, it's, it was free to register, should still be free. And I think there, it might actually just go through the end of the year, but that was a great presentation and it's on demand. You can watch it whenever you want. Awesome, thanks for that. We have our next question is a little bit about metrics. So they said, you mentioned using different tests to see if your subject line or content is most effective with viewers, but what metrics should I be using to show whether my email campaign is working? Awesome, I have some presentations where I actually go over what I call average stats and then there's going to be uh, industry stats. 
So pretty much the, the average open rate for a successful email should be about 20%. So just think about where you are compared to that. Uh, I don't want you to call yourself out, but if you're lower than that, strive to be higher. You know, if you're at 12%, try to be at, you know, 15 at your next email. Use some of the items that we talked about today to try to drive uh, those open rates. So 20%, uh, 5% is a target for click rates. And you want to have your unsubscribes be about, uh, uh, 0.05% or five per thousand email addresses. And those are pertinent to each individual domain. In other words, if you, um, you know, send to only Gmail and uh, five per thousand of those uh, should, should be uh, the unsubscribed spam complaints, uh, 0.05. Again, your bounce rate should be under 1%. Um, if you want specific industry stats, go to smartinsights.com. They cover almost every industry just go to smartinsights.com and search for average rates in the search box awesome thank you for all of that insight and those resources you mentioned as well uh, our last question says how does a newsletter fit into email marketing right a majority of clients that i contact use uh, newsletters it's a monthly newsletter that goes out kind of like what i do with my journal i just call it a journal but it's kind of like a newsletter mm -hmm. Um, they definitely fit in. Uh, I think that would, that's always been the staple of email marketing is having a newsletter. And then at one point, people start using it for promotional reasons, you know, retailers. But I, I think that newsletters are the backbone of email marketing. And then for retailers, it's more of a vehicle for sales. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Well, those are all the questions that I see. I just want to thank you so much for your time and for all those who attended with us today or who are listening to the recording. Thank you for joining us. A few reminders before we close out that you can always find previous webinar recordings and future webinars at bbbevents.org. Um, also, if you're accredited business, you can have your information listed on BBB Shop Local. And um, please be sure to send us your information so we can get it listed there. But I just thank you again for all of our attendees. And Hank, thank you so much for sharing your professional insight with us, us today. And um, I know it'll be super helpful in their future email marketing campaigns. Awesome. It was a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Have a great day, everyone.